Time magazine this week devotes 12 pages to what it calls the Jesus revolution that is taking place in the United States. For the last three or four years, those of us who are engaged in evangelism from coast to coast have detected a rising tide of spiritual interest among young people. Most of our crusades during the past year have been attended largely by young people. Various organizations working with young people, such as Campus Crusade for Christ, the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, Young Life, Youth for Christ, the Navigators, and many denominational youth organizations are finding that young people are turning to Christ by the thousands throughout the nation. New young evangelists are emerging, preaching the gospel in the contemporary language of modern youth. There's a new underground Christian press that now numbers 50 newspapers across the country. For example, the Hollywood Free Paper, which is a Christian underground newspaper, has more than 400,000 circulation. The new symbol among these young people is the clenched fist with the index finger raised, indicating one way, and that one way is Christ. This new encouraging development in America is happening at the same time that other thousands of young people are copping out with sex, drugs, and violence. A social critic interviewed on the Today Show this past week said that the violent revolutionary movement in America has become stagnated and apathetic, that it is losing its steam. The movement that is now gathering steam is this spiritual movement among young people. Time magazine says there's a morning freshness to this movement, a buoyant atmosphere of hope and love, along with the usual rebel zeal. Some converts seem to enjoy translating their faith into everyday life, like those who answer the phone with Jesus loves you instead of hello. But their love seems more sincere than a slogan, deeper than the fast-fading sentiments of the flower children, so says Time magazine. Time also says what startles the outsider is the extraordinary sense of joy that they're able to communicate. While many of these young people are accepting Jesus as a new revolutionary hero, and others are proclaiming that he was the first hippie, yet the vast majority of them hold a strong belief in the deity of Jesus Christ. Their lives revolve around the necessity for an intense personal relationship with Christ. Many of them even subscribe strictly to the Ten Commandments, rather than to the situation ethics and the new morality. This new spiritual revolution among young people rejects not only the material values of conventional society, but it also rejects modern American theology that is becoming increasingly secular and materialistic. During the past few years, thousands of young people have been turning to the mysticism of the East and to the occults. It was only five years ago that one of the Beatles, John Lennon, said that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus Christ. Now the Beatles are broken up, and one of them, George Harrison, is now singing my sweet Lord. Another phenomena in the theology of the Jesus movement is the great emphasis on the second coming of Jesus Christ. At this point, modern theology has completely failed to present an eschatological hope for the youth of our generation. They are now turning to the Bible and finding that God predicts the future and that a future will emerge with Jesus Christ on the throne. This message thrills, excites, and challenges the youth of our generation. Another characteristic of this revolution among young people is that they are turned off by a great deal of organized religion and the established churches. Many churches throughout the country are rapidly changing in order to accommodate to the vitality of these new young converts. Some people say that this movement among young people is a fad. There is no doubt that there are elements of it that are a fad. At the same time, in the middle of it, there are thousands of these young people are being truly converted to Jesus Christ. It is my prayer that they will get quickly into the Word of God so that they can grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. We're taught in the Scriptures that every time there's a spiritual movement, Satan is also busy sowing tares and raising up false prophets and teachers to lead the uninstructed away from the true faith. Jesus taught in the 12th chapter of Matthew that when an evil spirit goes out of a man, it travels over dry country looking for a place to rest. If it can't find one, it says to itself, I will go back to my house which I left. So it goes back and finds it empty, clean, and all fixed up. Then it goes out and brings along seven other spirits, even worse than itself, and they come and live there. 
So that man is in worse shape when it is all over than he was at the beginning. The greatest need among these new converts throughout America at this moment is Bible study and the teaching of the disciplines of the Christian life. There is evidence that this is already taking place in many parts of the country as young people are gathering for Bible study and prayer. I don't want to leave the impression today that the majority of American young people are suddenly turning to Christ. This is not true. It is still a minority, but it is growing rapidly. It may be the answer to the prayers of millions of Christians who have been praying for revival. Still, the vast majority of American young people are alienated, uncommitted, and not involved. There's a deep vacuum within the majority of American youth. They're searching for individual identity. They're searching for a challenge and a faith. And whoever captures the imagination of the young people of our generation will change the nation and change the world. Youth movements of the past have been perverted and captured by dictators and demagogues. Hitler captured the youth of Germany. Mao Zedong captured the youth of China. Castro captured the youth of Cuba. Perhaps the American young people will be captured by Jesus Christ. My own generation put far too much emphasis on materialism. In a strange way, the new young generation are not impressed by material prosperity. Time after time, young people tell me that their parents are interested in material prosperity and creature comforts. Then they go on to say, I want something more from my life. The great civilizations of the past have all failed when material things have predominated. Rome was defeated not by a stronger power, but by the free circuses. To stay popular, the emperors gave the people more and more of the ease they craved. Free bread, free circuses, easier living. So the Romans softened themselves, and the ambitious, hard-working barbarians in 410 A.D., came against the greatest nation in the world. That great nation of Rome was overthrown almost without a battle because of the softness within. In much of our modern education, there's a confusion of values. Young people are confused about what is morally right and what is morally wrong. Young people are confused about what they can believe in. In spite of more conveniences, more entertainment, more leisure, many psychologists agree that teenagers are more miserable and unhappy than the teenagers of the last generation. They're suffering more frustration. That is why suicide is now the third largest cause of death among students. This is one of the reasons why many teenagers are rioting, demonstrating, and rebelling. This is why many teenagers are turning to alcohol, drugs, and sex pleasures. This weekend, Leighton Ford is holding a crusade in Bridgeport, Connecticut. The emphasis of his crusades now is on young people. Hundreds of young people will be coming to hear the gospel proclaimed in New England this next week. And we're asking Christians everywhere to pray for that crusade. Just a little less than a month from now, we will be involved in a major crusade in Oakland, California. The emphasis of the crusade will be on young people. Last Sunday afternoon, we closed the Chicago crusade at McCormick Place. The average attendance in Chicago was 30,000 people a service with an average of over 1,200 coming forward to receive Christ at every service. Thousands of young people attended every night. Many of them had sweatshirts that read, Spiritual Revolution Now. Many of them were the Jesus people. Night after night, when I would stand up to speak, hundreds of young people would raise their fist with the index finger up. One or two of them shouted out, Right on! One night, when several hundred Satan worshippers invaded the crusade and said they were going to take over the platform, they were surrounded by hundreds of Christians who began to shout to them, Jesus loves you. They began to sing to them. The demonstration was a failure. The police did not have to intervene in the service. The Christian young people handled it themselves with love, songs, and Christian slogans. When I speak to these young people across America, I look at their faces and I see the youthful longing the search for reality, the questing, the wistful dreaming and hoping. What a thrilling experience it's been in Chicago to stand before thousands of them and declare the certainties of the gospel of Jesus Christ. These young people are desperately searching for answers to some of the deepest problems of life. Thousands of these young people are groping in the jungle of uncertainty. How far afield the modern church has drifted from the certainty of Paul who said, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Paul's epistles are really shouts of Eureka. He was saying over and over again, I have found him, I have found him, I have found life's great goal. 
I found a hope that is both steadfast and sure. The Apostle Paul was certain that Jesus Christ was the embodiment of all truth and that Christ was the fulfillment of all the longing and desires and the questioning and the questing minds of his day. When the Apostle Paul stood before King Agrippa to witness for Christ, he could have resorted to his knowledge of philosophy. He might have employed the logic he had learned at the feet of Gamaliel at the university. He might have used his broad travel knowledge to impress the king. But no, something beyond logic, beyond philosophy, beyond knowledge had happened to Paul. And these words, like a flame of fire, leaped from his lips. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me, and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, which thou persecutest. So unapologetic was Paul, so simple, so certain, so dogmatic about the person of Christ and his own personal experience with Christ that this pagan king was almost persuaded to become a Christian. This is the same certainty and the same simplicity that American young people are searching for. This is the same certainty that thousands of young people are finding throughout America. The church's power in the first century was that element of certainty. Now we believe not because of thy sayings, for we've heard him ourselves, said the Samaritans, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. What these simple Samaritan believers declared with so much emphasis as to their own witness of Christ is found throughout the New Testament. Believe us, they all cry. We have experienced Christ for ourselves. This note of certainty rings throughout the record of the early church, and it was that element in Christianity that was revolutionary. It was that element that turned the world of the first century upside down. At this hour, Christians can rejoice that throughout America, God is using his word when proclaimed and witnessed in the power of the Holy Spirit, whether it is from the lips of a preacher or a young person on a street corner. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we thank thee that at this hour thou art raising up Christians from all over America in every walk of life to witness as to the saving grace and power of Jesus Christ. And we pray that thou wouldst bless them Guard them, protect them from the attacks of Satan. And we pray that those that are listening to our voice throughout the world will this day come to find the same certainty in Jesus Christ. For we ask it in his name. Amen.